Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. What's the old saying? Uh, hang on, what is it? It's a uh, cross my heart, hope to die, rub some hot sauce in my eye. Sounds that, about right. That it? <laughs> I feel like my mom told me that when I was a kid. Uh, literally minutes before we started recording, I rubbed some hot sauce in my eye. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. This is episode 123. It's March 18th, 2019. You're listening to or watching Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Blake Arnsdorf. For the usual. And also joining us is Elise Hallett. Hello, hello. Hey, what's going on? You are here for a very special reason. Uh, you know, some might say so. Some might say so. Um, yeah, we do have a lot to talk about today. One of them is going to be previewing the healthcare symposium, which you, our field correspondent, is going out and actually going to be able to uh, potentially get some interviews out, out of some folks there and uh, you know provide some coverage of what's going on at healthcare symposium as you have in the years prior. Uh, we're going to be talking about some news. Uh, Apple and Stanford, their Apple Watch study, they identified some irregular heartbeats. Uh oh. Uh, facial recognition at U.S. airports. Should you be concerned? That's a clickbait title. And are you already <laughs> concerned? Are you already concerned? Valve psychologist to explore brain computer interface research at GDC. And Google Doodle celebrates inventor who improved public space for people with low vision. Okay. Uh, but first, hey, we're on YouTube. Go like, subscribe, smash that subscribe button. Make Jeff happy. Make Jeff's day. We, we need 100 people. So go do that. Um, hey, HFES Healthcare Symposium giveaway winner has been contacted. So go check your email. Make sure it wasn't you. Uh, we're still waiting to hear back from you. So go check that out. But hey, it's banter time. So uh, elephant in the room here. We've been off the air for two weeks. And reason being is that we had some scheduling conflicts. Um, Blake, you got back from a trip. And, and I had some stuff going on in my life, one of which was pretty major. And I, I, I want to share, now that I can, with our listeners. What happened, um, Nick? So I proposed to my partner of six years uh, over, I guess it was uh, last weekend. And um, she said no. And uh, Oh, yeah, here we go. And uh, yeah, no. No, she said yes. And um, <laughs> I, I have to say, like, some of that process has been really weird. So I remember confiding in you, Blake, that kind of sneaking around my partner um, and like trying to size her rings while she's not looking. And then, you know, as um, engagement would come up in casual conversation to skirt around the topic and be like, yeah, well, my friends didn't even get, they didn't even get engaged until they were like 10 years into their relationship. So, you know, it's kind of like all that skirting around. Yeah, good. That's just what the girl wants to hear. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, um, it was really difficult lying to the person that you love. Uh, and it, it was, it, it's definitely an experience. Uh, yeah, I would say so. <laughs> I mean, having to figure out how to, uh, I guess, ma manipulate situations so you can get the rings. Yeah. And then through conversation, make it not sound like you don't want to get married, but, you know, at the same time, not that you're planning to do it soon or anything. Yeah. So I, I know, uh, there, I don't know, it's been, it's been weird. I know a couple people are probably interested in what the ring looks like and uh, how it all happens. So I'll describe at least how it happened uh, and post pictures of the ring here. Uh, Jeff, enter them right here. There you go. Um, so this is the ring, and uh, it's it's basically this black diamond that's held up by four skulls, and then on the skulls there are these uh, black diamond um, uh, uh, spines that kind of hold it up. She's kind of a gothy, deathy person. She she enjoys dead people more than alive people, so it, it all kind of works out. But the way it happened was, um, you know, we I, I was out of town for a user event, and uh, said I wouldn't be home basically until late that night, uh, but I got home at like right after she went to work and cleaned the whole house. And as she came home, I basically uh, said I don't want to go into our anniversary weekend as your boyfriend anymore. I want to be uh, your fiance. And and then uh, dressed up our cats as uh, bride and groom. So I say, don't leave that out. <laughs> don't leave please. the cats out. Uh, and I I believe there's some video in here um, and set up some candles with the the cats just sitting on the couch. Um, but I want to know what's going on in your guys' world. Uh, Blake, do you have anything? I don't. I'm just glad to be back here on the podcast again. Not a whole lot of bantering stuff to go through. Two weeks and nothing. No hot sauce in your eye. Yeah, I, just, I just hit the other eye, so we'll see how that happens. Oh, my goodness. That's right here. Can you guys see me starting to sweat? 
Uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't look like fun over there. Okay, no, yeah, it's bad. Uh, we'll see if we can get you some milk. Just a quick follow-up on that. Uh, we had a, a, a small celebration at work today, and um, tacos were served, and so I brought some hot, hot, hot sauce uh, that made everybody sweat, including myself, and um, so now I'm paying for it sauce. because I had... To, don't touch your eyes after you touch hot sauce, apparently. Well, it's, it's, it's karma, frankly. I mean, <laughs> if you could hear these people talk after they tried this hot sauce, it was A serious. lot of them it liked it. Funny A lot hear. of them liked it. <laughs> okay. Nobody liked it. All right. So let's get here to the main event. Elise, you are here to help us break down what's going on at Healthcare Symposium. I just kind of want to do this healthcare preview. Um, so I, I will hand it over to your capable hands to run us through the Healthcare Symposium. Well, sure. But before I do that, actually, I had um, banter of my own. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look at you. Just, you know. Throwing curveballs in the notes. Yeah, I just got to keep these guys on their toes. Um, so... Let's see, was it last weekend? It was last weekend. No, the weekend before that. You're looking at me actually. like I know what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually went up to Long Beach, about an hour and a half up north from here, and went to a student conference that was done. They have a local uh, Human Factors and Ergonomics Society chapter uh, at CSU Long Beach. So there's uh, students there that you know meet routinely, and then every year they put on this conference in the spring to you know, provide more of an opportunity for students there who are interested in human factors to, um, you know, get get awareness of what's going on in the field. So there are usually a couple speakers that come, and then there's a breakout poster session where students who are doing research in human factors at um, nearby schools can come and present their work. So it's a pretty good opportunity, especially for those who are really thinking about getting into human factors. So a um, couple of the speakers there, one was actually from our company talking about how her education in human factors has translated into the Department of Defense, you know, how some of the courses that she's um, taken in the past have translated into the products that she's actually working on today in the real world. Um, and then the other speaker talked a bit about different applications in human factors, including um, Stuff with the space center, with lawn darts, with websites. It was quite a variety. Very exciting. So space to lawn darts. That had to be the best talk ever. Yeah, it was a really great segue. I wish Holy I could remember cow. it. So this happens once a year here at, at Long Beach. It does. Yeah, usually in the spring and the March time frame, the students put it on. So if you're if you happen to be in the area around spring, it's a great time to come and meet folks uh, from all over coming to CSU Long Beach. Okay. Now let's jump into the healthcare symposium stuff. Sure, we could do that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so healthcare symposium, another conference put on by Human Factors and Ergonomic Society. So this is also typically done in the spring, but um, it's uh, you know the for those who have ever been to the international uh, HFES conference that's done in the fall, you have probably seen the variety that goes on there. There's a lot of different tracks in. Um, you know, military, healthcare, uh, so such a wide range of applications in human factors. Um, but they, you know, do kind of these these more specific uh, tracks for you know different areas of interest. So the healthcare symposium is one of those that really just focuses on the healthcare application side of things for human factors. So at the conference, they usually have four different tracks. Um, there's clinical and consumer healthcare IT. There's hospital environments for those um, practitioners actually embedded in the hospital doing research. There's medical and drug delivery devices for those who are focused more on like the usability, testing, and um, development of medical devices. And then patient safety research and initiatives. Um, so quite a vari wide variety, but a cool opportunity for people of you know, slightly different backgrounds. It's, you know, human factors, practitioners, and those in academia, as well as doctors and physicians and nurses. Um, a lot of different collectives coming together to talk about um, really patient safety and reducing human error. So pretty cool opportunity. Um, this year, they've got a keynote uh, with Dr. Richard Cook, who's going to be talking about resilience engineering and specifically about how resilience and resilience engineering are related and how resilience engineering applies to different settings. Um, and there's also a student design competition there. So this year it is titled the Mobile Health Applications for Consumers. So 
that'll be kind of cool to check out too. Sure. So I, I have a question here. So uh, I've been to HFES. I've never been to the healthcare symposium, but both of you guys have gone before. Uh, what's kind of the general vibe around the healthcare symposium? Because I feel like when we go to like HFES, it's very much um, human factors focused. A lot of practitioners there are here to learn from other practitioners. Uh, but this, since this is like a, not just human factors people, this is doctors, this is nurses, this is uh, industrial design people. Like, what is the sort of vibe around the conference floor? So I feel I'll hop in real quick. I mean, I feel like the biggest benefit of this conference for people in human factors is that you're interacting with a lot more people that are outside of your domain. Like, even when we go to the HFES, it's very much like people know what you're talking about. They understand the importance of it, that kind of stuff. But you really are interacting with, like, people from the FDA, people that develop some of this software or put together mobile applications for different you know, healthcare tracks. And then there's also like even learning about stuff like resilience engineering and how it applies to the medical field. So I feel like it has a large benefit on a human factors practitioner, mainly because it's exposing you to a different field and also like a very specified field that has a lot of applications from an HF perspective. Yeah, and just to tag on to that, I think this conference in particular is really focused on what, you know, human factors in healthcare is, is mostly about, I wouldn't say all about, um, but that's really, you know, patient safety, like ultimately ensuring that the devices, the systems, the systems of systems are all ensuring, you know, human error is, is mitigated um, to ensure, the, you know, the safest treatment possible for, for people involved. So, you know, the fact that there are people coming from all these different disciplines really shows, I think, a, a desire and a, a you know need to um, you know further understand how we can further decrease you know human error within the healthcare setting and that's why we've got all these different you know backgrounds coming into play to try and tackle this problem we're going to try to talk to a couple of them right we're sending you out there um, schedule is still being determined so stay tuned for that but uh, we should have more news soon hopefully um, I, I want to touch on a couple things. So I was looking through the program, and I really hope you can make this because it would be wonderful to hear back. If not, that's okay. I understand there's things that you want to see too. Uh, but if any of our listeners are going and want to go to this as well, um, there's uh, in particular, there are two things that I, I want to see uh, or hear about. So there's this usability, adoption, and workflow, clinical and consumer healthcare IT, um, or I guess it's uh, usability, adoption, and workflow. Um, and it looks like cognitive usability evaluation of electronic health record systems. Uh, that's on Monday at 1.30. Now, reason being is over the last couple months, I've slowly kind of devolved into this obsessive compulsive person with tracking my health data. Uh, and I feel like this could be closely related. Um, and I'm struggling to find an app to hold everything, uh, like my medical records, my... Uh, blood pressure, my um, like every single metric that you can feasibly uh, collect in a consumer home setting, I have started to collect uh, blood glucose even um, to the point where I'm pricking my finger to get information about my body. Um, and it's for no other reason other than I kind of want as much information about me as I can. And so I feel like something like this might have applications to that. And, and maybe that's a the actual application for me is a, a whole nother banter talk, but um, that'd be interesting. The other thing that I saw that caught my eye is VR as a prototyping tool in healthcare design. Um, so there, it's a poster session Tuesday, uh, and that session's from 4.30 to 6 p.m. So if you can make it, that'd be awesome. I'll do my very best, Nick. Okay. All right, so let's get into Human Factors News. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. This is where we break down everything related to the topic of sports. No, I'm just kidding. Human Factors. This can be anything from uh, medical. We just talked a little bit about that. Transportation, psychology, whatever it is, as long as it relates to the field of Human Factors, it is fair game for us here to talk about it in the studio today, in the studio with everybody here today. Blake, what do we got up first? Apparently, we today we have yeah. something to talk you were, about. You were waiting for it. All yeah. right. What do we got first? All right. So first up, keeping in line with all the medical talk. So Apple and Stanford University School of Medicine each issued a press release this week that, citing that the results of the Apple Heart Study that, jo that was jointly announced in 2017. Wow. 
So Stanford Medicine also took its findings to the American College of Cardiology 68th Annual Scientific Session and Expo. So Apple says that people from 50 states participated over the course of eight months. And according to the university, around 0.5% of all participants, so over 2,000 people, received notifications alerting them of heart rate irregularities over the course of the study. It instances where users received an irregular heart rhythm notification. Doctors gave study participants. Doctors gave study participants were were a digital consultation as well as an electrocardiogram patch for further monitoring. So readings from their electro electrical heart rhythm were recorded for a week using a proper ECG patch in most of these cases. And from the sound of it, Stanford is treating the Apple Heart Study as a stepping stone into additional research into how just how useful wearable consu- consumer devices can be when monitoring our day-to-day health and produce, predicting trouble. However, many health experts are concerned that giving consumers more data to pour over isn't necessarily a good thing and could be a strain on our healthcare systems. And that's kind of interesting, Nick, because that's a little bit converse to what you want to do. You're looking to get all of the data, yeah, and doctors are concerned <laughs> to give you all the data. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense that they'd be concerned to give us all the data because then we can draw our own conclusions. Not only that, but it could be unsafe to draw our own conclusions, right? I You're mean, basically this, your own WebMD at this point. Yeah, and we all know what kind of deep, dark hole you can go down on WebMD. When you are not trained in that uh, domain, you can sort of make assumptions that may not be true. Very, very true. Now, the I guess the interesting part here is that there was that many... Obviously, there's only over 2,000 people in the study, but to have that many people get this kind of notification that you've got irregular heartbeats, and then the next step was, okay, well, let's get all of these people pieces of equipment that they can have on their own to keep tracking to see how they're doing. Mm-hmm. So I think it's still a good diagnostic tool, even if it's just for doctors to see and kind of interact with their patients that way. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. It's It all comes back to how do you notify the person who is potentially at risk without freaking them out and, uh, you know, providing actionable recommendations that they can act on, like go see a doctor um, and show them this. Elise, what are you thinking? Well, I mean, I think it kind of taps into one of the, the issues with going to the doctor is, and that's it's one snapshot in time when you go in and speak with a physician. And no matter how good that physician is, they're still relying on, on any available information that oftentimes it's mostly the patient who's providing. And, you know, the patient only knows what, you know, he or she knows, and it might not be very much. So it, it kind of raises an interesting point of if you can capture this information over time, that might be, you know, if it's you know produced and not just an information that an information format that doesn't freak the patient out, but also a format that helps physicians read it, then it gives them a bigger picture of what might be going on. Yeah, there's some interesting uh, kind of fun facts that we pulled out of this article here that I kind of want to dig into. So it was a uh, comparisons between irregular pulse detection on Apple Watch and simultaneous EEG uh, patch recordings showed the pulse detection algorithm indicating a positive tachogram reading, has a 71% positive predictive value. Uh, so that's alone. It feels uh, unbelievably that's high. That's high. Uh, and then 84% of the time, patients who received irregular pulse notifications were found to be in uh, atrial fibrillation at the time of the notification. Well, that sounds like a bad thing, but I'm not really sure uh, exactly what that means. I don't either. We're both frantically Googling what that means. Uh, <laughs> let's see. So quivering or, or a regular heartbeat. Okay, so that's what they're... Oh, I'm a bad host. I didn't oh. put in airplane mode. Check that out. All I right, here it. we go. Airplane mode. <laughs> okay, so this is a regular heartbeat that can lead to, oh, wow, blood clots, stroke, heart failure, and other related complications. So what this tells me is that this is a pretty high correlation... Um, between this actually happening happening and the irregular pulse notification. So 84% of the time, this is what it was detecting. And so that's pretty high. Yeah, that's, that's really incredible, to be honest. I mean, thinking about that, it's just off of your, like, Apple Watch. Right. Like, that's all that you had to be doing and wearing. This could have, predict, could have predicted, in some cases, like, this is being extreme, but you could have avoided a stroke, potentially. Now, I guess my question is, like, when does this come to other companies? This is, uh, this is Apple. 
when are they going to make this available to some of their competitors if it's going to save lives? Isn't there like some like doctrine that says you have to release something that could potentially... I, I don't know. Or will they? Will they? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because this was a smart thing on Apple's part from my perspective is they partnered with a big medical university to study their own product. And now it's probably going to force or even in some degrees call other companies like Fitbit to do it. Because if you haven't yeah. done this, you don't have the, the backing from Stanford to say like, oh, we, we moderated the study and these are the things we found from the algorithms they're using and the technology they have. Then this is basically giving them a better selling point. Right? Yeah, so I, I don't know if the, I doubt they're gonna have to share it with anybody, um, and I'm sure it's not even detailed anywhere in the papers, like the nuances of the tech. Uh, but it's still, it's still incredible, um, regardless. Yeah. Uh, so another fun fact here is that one third, thirty four percent, thirty four percent of the participants who received these irregular pulse notifications um, and followed up using this ECG patch over a week later. We're found to have the uh, atrial fibrillation, um, and we just said that, I think. So, so it looks like um, a week later, they still had the atrial fibrillation. I think that's the interesting point there. Uh, and then... Well, even further than that, that second sentence there, that since the arterial fibrillation is an intermittent condition, kind of going back to what you were talking about, Elise, about like at a snapshot view, it's hard for a doctor to make predictions, right. that it would actually go undetected by something like an ECG patch, which is what they gave these people as a follow-up measure. So it's um, this is extreme again, but it's almost like without the Apple Watch, you wouldn't have been able to see this in this many people and diagnose it this way. Yeah. That's intense. That's really... I uh, mean, I just love... All this data. I, I'm, like, nerding out about the data. Um, there's one more fun fact here. Uh, 57% of those who received irregular pulse notifications sought medical attention. So this, they, what this tells me is that um, they are producing a message where over half of the people that read it feel like it's a cause to action. Uh, uh, it, 50% of the people who read it, or over 50%, uh, think that there is cause for concern and... Um, Apple has provided some sort of a actionable feedback for them to go and seek help. Which is incredible, right? Because, like, is that done through the app itself? Or do they just like, hey, know. you've got an irregular heartbeat, and that's kind of it, and they're like, oh, maybe I should call my doctor. But I think it, I mean, it, it goes back to it, you know, having these high ratings of being able to, you know, predict some of these conditions. Otherwise, it ties into what people are concerned about and that it could strain healthcare systems. So, you think about, you know, if if you see a warning that's related to your health, you probably are going to go to your doctor. But think about how many false alarm ratings you might get. Like that's something that you have to think about very carefully. Otherwise, you're going to get all these people flooding, you know, healthcare systems for no reason. So it's it's not something to take lightly. I think. No, I'm I'm looking for any sort of notification. It shows the watch notification, but it doesn't show you like what type of information you get when you follow up with the Apple Heart study. Like if you click on this, does it give you additional information that says like what this thing is or what it could be and to go see somebody? Um because that's that's what I don't I don't get, right? Like the the sort of image here in the article only says like, "Hey, here's information about the study and you have some sort of irregular heart uh, beat going. Yeah, so it goes back to how do you support decision making, right? You, like, right? you won't just notify them, like you were saying, but um, you also want to provide the why, and that's probably you know, an important element to this that may be motivating a lot of people going in. Yeah, I mean, you, you would have to have actionable steps or something like that, because you can't just report it, notify somebody, and hope they figure it out, because I, I feel like that puts you in a really bad place in, from a legal perspective. Oh, yeah. It's but at least you bring up a really good point about it, because I didn't even think of this. I was thinking more on the lines of people go, and now they have all this information, and they're making decisions about their health, and maybe, like, combating with their doctor about the decisions that the doctor may have about their health record or anything they're seeing in their data. But you make a better point about you could be flooding a bunch of people, because, I mean, 57% of, let's let's be like overly conservative of the 2000 people is over a thousand people going to the doctor and how many of those actually really needed to. Um, now it's, it seems like everybody did that recognized this cause it could have a lot of like health implications, but what if this is something else 
like let's say we get to the point where we're able to do blood glucose monitoring through an Apple Watch in some way. That's really kind of outside the realm. But what is how is that going to impact the amount of people that are going to the to the doctor and like clogging up the healthcare system that maybe don't need to? It's it's just a it's kind of an interesting problem that's going to develop over time. And I think people like Nick and myself, and to you to some extent, will have. I, I want to know as much data as I can because I just think it's in, it's fun to have. Love data. Yeah. And so you can much just, data. You can t- make a lot <laughs> of really informed decisions by having more data about yourself, but you have to trust your doctor too. So, like, the fine line is very interesting for me. And I don't know what, like, the, the quote-unquote every man is going to do or every woman, every person is going to be like, oh, I don't really care, but if my Apple Watch tells me that I might be dying, I'm going to go to the doctor. Um, it's just in error rates and all that kind of stuff will be interesting over the next 10 years. Okay, why don't we jump into the next story? All right. So we've talked about this before on the podcast, but if you were not concerned about facial recognition, should you be now? So facial recognition will be deployed at the top 20 U.S. airports by 2021 for 100% of all international passengers, including American citizens, according to an executive order issued by President Trump. The move is part of plans to protect the nation from terrorist activities by foreign nationals admitted to the United States. But according to BuzzFeed, the United States Department of Homeland Security is rushing to get systems up and running at airports across the country without proper vetting and regulatory safeguards. Privacy advocates argue that this rollout is in defiance of the law, and the site has over about 347 pages of documents obtained from the nonprofit research organization Electric Privacy Information Center. It is the goal... If the, its goal is achieved, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, so, Border Protection so-called biometric entry exit system, will be using facial recognition technology on travers, travelers aboard 16,300 flights per week. So it amounts mo- to more than 100 million passengers traveling on international flights out of the United States and in Europe. The EU General Update and, Pr- and Data Protection Regulation. So the GDPR stipulates that biometric. Get up yeah, there we go. Get up here. Stipulates that biometric information is personal data and must be protected, but facial recognition is already in use in the UK and this self-service e-passport fast lane for passport checks. So massive projects have wide scale implications and should not be rushed as the rush of implementation may result in poor system design, security and reliability as a result of the short time frame. Well, all I got to say is, is Facebook had plenty of data breaches and they existed for a very long time with some of the smartest people that we have in the country and in out- outside the country. So if this is being quickly rushed to put together, I'd be afraid the data is going to get leaked. Yeah. So, OK, this is this is the privacy argument again. Right. It's it's do we rush this and um, be what is argued to be more secure um, or do we take this slow and do it right? So that way, consumer data protection, in this case, facial recognition data, uh, your face as a biometric marker is protected. Um and this is, I, I almost feel tired of <laughs> talking about this because it, it, it all comes back to where do your values lie? For me, I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of my privacy for security. Um, and that's just me. I, and maybe it's the generation that I grew up in, uh, but I don't, I don't care that my data is out there. I'm collecting literally biometric data about myself as we speak. Um, my voice is out there. Uh, and of course, you know, there are uh, some things that I have to keep private, but like, I, I just feel like as much of my data that's out there, I don't, I, it doesn't bother me. And I, I understand the need for data privacy, but I don't know. It's, it's a, it's an argument that comes back around and I, we can talk about it again because that's what we're here for. But in terms of uh, rushing legislation to uh, for for more security, I, I, yes, it needs to be done right. I get, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I feel like this is a tough one for me, but ultimately, there are cameras in the airport. You have to give them so much information when you buy a ticket. You scan either your passport if you're traveling. Your, well, if it's international, you're going to scan your passport. All this information that is 
already being collected on you. The only thing that's really being added is recognizing your face. And that exists somewhere on a camera that's sitting in like some security office right now anyway. But now we're basically feeding it into a system that's able to recognize you based off your face. And I think this ultimately is going to have a lot of kind of positive impact for travelers. Like security things aside, it could make just the travel experience a lot faster in terms of getting you through security and checking in and all that, that kind of stuff. That would be wonderful. And that's stuff we've talked about before. So I think there's a lot of good that's going on. The the part that I'm not so convinced about is like how this is violating the law in terms of taking your personal data. Because again, it's it's this information is being taken from you anyway, and a lot of it you're having to willingly give. And you don't necessarily sign a consent form when you walk into the airport to be videotaped, yet you are. Yeah. Well, yeah I don't know. It's it's tough. At least what do you think? I mean, I'm I'm kinda with Nick. I'm you know, generally pretty willing to sacrifice a little bit of um, you know, privacy for security. But I mean the thing that's really concerning with this is more like the systems of systems approach. Are we rushing this and what are we gonna sacrifice by rushing this? I mean we've not gonna get into politics, but we've seen cases where things get rushed recently and it just doesn't work out. So um, I think, you know, just coming from the human factors background and perspective of just thinking about all the implications, the systems of systems approach and in implementing this and making sure that, you know, the, the risks are identified and mitigated to the best that we can, um, you know, anticipate for it. Like, that's what I would want to see right if, you know, my face is getting taken from me unwillingly anyway. So let's answer this question. Should you be concerned about your biometric data being collected at an airport? So, Is it a cop-out to say it depends? No. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. We say it like for <laughs> half these stories usually. No, I don't, I don't think it's a cop-out at all. But should we be concerned? So I wanna, I'm going to take <laughs> an alternative take on what can I say take one more time? I think I can. But the re- here's... I don't know. Maybe this is maybe this doesn't even make sense, but it might. So maybe, maybe I don't know. Run what if the me. what if the rush has to do with something that's not reported in the study? Okay, or in this paper, right? I'm, I'm following. What if yeah? What if there's what a, if there's a reason to go ahead and put this in place because okay. there's enough enough things that exist out in the world tracking that you could be afraid of? Okay. So I I don't think there's necessarily anything to be concerned about. More than I would be more worried the why is it being rushed so fast? What's that's what worries me more. Not necessarily the technology itself. You ready for a politics bomb? It's because we have a xenophobic president who's also racist and wants to protect us from non-white people. So it's, it's potentially true. Th- there we go. So that's probably the reason why this thing wants to get rushed. I'm just saying. Uh that's that's my political opinion, but uh okay. I think uh, that's a good place to take a quick break. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember... It depends. Oh, is it getting hot in here? Or is it just uh, the politics? Oh, it's it's both. <laughs> it's both. probably that hot sauce. Probably. It's, oh God, it's everything. It's hot in here. I rub hot sauce in my eye. Uh, man, I'm sweating in here. The studio is hot. We need some AC in here. Anyway, before we continue, I just want to thank all of our friends at Road to VR, The Verge, Forbes, and Sydney Morning Herald. I wonder where that one came from, Mateo. I don't know. <laughs> For all of our news stories this week, if you want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join Slack to see what Mateo's posted in there because we pulled a lot of these from him. Thank you for covering our butts while we were gone. Uh, okay, we got a couple more stories here. Blake, what do we have up next? All right, so at GDC 2019 this week, Valve's principal experimental psychologist, Mike Ambinder, will present the latest research pertaining to brain-computer interfaces using signals from the brain as a computer input. 
So Ambender act says that the BCIs is still a speculative technology, but could play an important role in the way players interact with the games of the future. So as time moves forward, the means by which users interact with computers has been becoming increasingly more natural. So more natural computer interfaces make it easier for us to communicate our intent to a computer, making computers more accessible and useful with less time spent learning the abstract input pr input systems. Perhaps the final frontier of computer inputs is the BCI or brain computer interface where the brain can directly talk to a computer and the computer can direct, directly quote unquote talk back with no ab abstraction and input output needed. So advances in brain computer interface science research are beginning to shed light on how players may interact with games in the future. While current interaction patterns are restricted to in, in interpretations of mouse, keyboard, gamepad, and gestural controls, future generations of interfaces may include the ability to interpret, interpret neurological signals in ways that promise quicker, more sensitive actions, much wider arrays of possible inputs, real-time adaption of game state to a player's internal state, and qualitatively different kinds of gameplay experiences. His talk is actually going to cover the near-term and long long-term outlook of BCI research for the game industry, but will be an emphasis on how technology stemming from this research can benefit developers in the present day. So while we're still pretty far, far away from having something direct like an input-output to the brain from to your computer, there has been some headway made in recent years for brain reading. And we've talked about this a fair amount on the show. And there's also the exciting potential for technology to transform the way we interact with computers and how computers ultimately will interact with and react to us. That was a lot of me talking. That was a lot of everything. But yeah. nonetheless, so brain-computer interfaces being applied to games before most other kinds of potential applications is surprising to me. I really thought that we would see this a, like a lot more in healthcare. See, it's, it's funny to me that you find it surprising because I feel like a lot of leading, um, like, innovative solutions come from the gaming industry. Or at least the entertainment field. Yeah, like, you know, you look at a lot of gaming um, interfaces, for example, and then you go to the military applications. Where are they looking? They're looking at these games and the, the interfaces. And it's not just because their their primary users are, are using these games, but it's because they're generally really intuitive and there's a lot of research that goes into the entertainment industry in general so the fact that these innovative solutions are stemming from this i actually i mean i'm, I'm not as surprised yeah valve does crush it especially with their kind of like research side of their company so this it doesn't surprise me it's coming from valve specifically but what they do you think nick they don't crush it with their curation that's for sure you hear about that yeah. that's a whole separate story we can talk about it offline um fantastic <laughs> uh but yeah i i think so the application of this to video games is interesting to me, obviously. You and I, Blake, are both big gamers. And uh, so, like, the, the potential of what this could look like in a few years is really exciting to me. Um, the fact that a game could react based on my heart rate, which I track, uh, is, is exciting because then it could, in tense situations, maybe calm me down a little bit or... Um, you know, if I have a low heartbeat or whatever, it picks up and boom, something action packed happens. And then I'm suddenly in the thick of it. Um, also think about like masking senses. If you're plugged into the BCI, it might actually be able to hijack your nervous system in a way that, uh, you can feel what's going on in the game. And that is also really exciting to me and scary too, right? You can feel the gunshots now and, and you can, you can feel the walls, but your body may not be moving. Um, and you might be sig sending the signals and this BCI might be intercepting them. So all that is, is like the ultimate promise of what BCIs can provide in these entertainment, uh, environments. Um, I'm really curious to hear this talk. I follow GDC pretty closely. Um, and so, I, I will be interested to see what this guy says uh, and and sort of what other potential notes he has. I'm not quite sure. So GDC is this week. I'm not sure when he talks. Um, Just for everybody else, what does GDC stand uh, for? Game Developers Conference. There so, we go. Yeah. So so it is the um, it is sort of the gathering of all these game developers where they share different technologies and different um, uh, interaction methodology for the field of gaming specifically. Um, but 
because this is a novel way to interact with an environment, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. So this is this is actually going to happen on Friday here. So stay tuned. I'll probably be watching this um, as it hits. Uh, but apparently the takeaway is that attendees should leave the talk understanding the pros and cons of various lines of BCI research, as well as an appreciation for the potential ways this work could change the way players interact with games in the future. That is very vague. Um, Super vague. I think the blurb was more exclusive than that. Yeah. So, I, I mean... And, and I think I hit some of the high notes there, but I, I'd be curious to see what somebody who studies this and um, especially the interaction with video games. So that's my two cents. One final note. Um, as Blake was going on and talking about this whole... Rambling. Um, yeah. Blurb, long blurb. Droning. <laughs> yeah. Dr- <laughs> um, Nick, have you seen Captain Marvel yet? I have. So no spoilers, I, I promise. Spoiler alert. Oh, I'm going to give a big spoiler right now. Goose is awesome. Goose is awesome. Goose. <laughs> anyway, um, the whole t- I don't know about you guys, but the whole time I was watching it, I was like, what is it with these interfaces? Like, all all the, the individuals outside of Earth, um, they just do this, like, on a screen, and then magically, like, the suit color changes, or, like, exactly what they were envisioning happens, and there's, like, no buttons or anything, and it's just... And I think the the movie itself is kind of a funny depiction of where technology was in the 90s versus, you know, this futuristic technology. And it's just such a stark difference into how far we've come, kind of touching on what this blurb, you know, mentions with, you know, how, you know, we might not be completely there in, you know, brains interacting directly with technology, but how far we've come is just mind-boggling you just did a wonderful thing but you did it too early you gave me a perfect segue into our new section when you said how interfaces were in the 1990s but we're not there yet so we'll get there but uh yeah i know i i completely agree i think um you know it, it, it only makes sense for them to be kind of hooked into those interfaces because they did just do a couple of touches and uh and i mean they even do allude to some of the technology of the 1990s so yeah be curious to see where uh bcis go uh, especially with uh, Mr. Musk over there doing Neuralink. Yeah, um, that's that's the uh, more interesting part to me as well. Is like the, I feel like the game industry is going to get ahead of him on this kind of stuff. So the near term and long term should be really interesting to mm-hmm. hear from uh, what is it? Ann Bender's talk. Yeah, yeah. All right, we got one more story. Why don't we break it down? All right, Mateo, this is for you. So Australia is embarking on the world's largest study into how. Al- how to make autonomous weapons such as future armed drones behave more ethically in warfare. So the $9 million, pr- pro- $9 million project funded by the Defense Department highlights that... The- <laughs> what? I just realized you didn't change the top one. I said Google Doodle, and now it's this. It's like, what? No, we didn't. Yeah. Okay, all Told right. Told you so I dropped that one, didn't I? Yeah, we're doing something different, guys. We're doing killer robots taught to ethics in world-topping Australia research project. I think okay. you should leave it to Blake. Yeah, all right, Blake. You're, you're yeah. better at reading these blurbs than I am. Why don't you get into it? Crushing like, it. So the $9 million me project by funded by d- the Defense Department highlights what is still seen by many people as science fiction in the looming reality of to military leaders who see machines playing a growing role in decision-making and combat. So a lot of people speak about the ethics and law of autonomous weapons, killer robots, and whatever else you, make, you maybe can think of, but not many people are actually trying to s- provide any accurate solutions to the problem. So the Australian Defense Force has a policy that decisions to kill will never be made solely by machines, but rather will always include a human. But most senior military officers say computers with advanced artificial intelligence will increasingly help curate information, make recommendations, and issue warnings that will help shape battlefield commanders' decisions. So it's kind of a, an interesting topic to deal with, right? Because we've talked about making smart weapons, and now there's this push to, and I think we've seen this even in our own country too, of trying to understand what are the ethical, ethical implications of AI and where do we have to draw the line between what decisions that AI representative can make versus what they can't. And now Australia is even taking a step further and kind of looking, I think, a little more forward thinking than a lot of countries of how do we how do we include this in decision making in combat? And then what are the rules of engagement for AI? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Powerful Nick Rome. (laughs) Look, I mean, like the the whole where do we draw the line? I think this is good, right? This is leaving the control in the hands of the human operator rather than an autonomous decision maker. Um, and we're we're 
we're pulling back from that killer robots, although the robots are still enacting the action. Um, so that's a little cause for concern, but still, I, I think, you know, putting this decision in, I don't know, man, we talked about getting close to the trigger. This gets close to the trigger. This is as close as you can get, because now it's decision-making related to combat. Rel- the human is still making the decision whether or not to take a life. Uh, and, yeah. But in this case, <laughs> again, like we've talked about before, this uh, the ability to have AI kind of in your corner has a lot of implications to make things ultimately safer for all parties involved. It's like crass as that sounds, because like they even mentioned, this could be more advanced intelligence gathering and curation. So hopefully your decisions are more informed and maybe that even impacts, you know, weapons you use. Yeah, it's interesting tying in the ethical piece too. I mean, there's a big question of, you know, what what is ethics? What is ethical? How do you define that? But starting down that road, I think at least starts to address some of people's concerns when they think about systems killing people because that, you know, erases the humanity of it. So, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the interesting bit to me, and this is kind of what you're alluding to, Blake, and I I often, whenever we talk about this topic, I struggle with it um, for reasons that I've aired on other episodes, but... The, the piece that's interesting to me is that they are providing, um, they're, they're curating information for the person so that way the person can, ma- can make the most informed decision that they possibly can. It is making recommendations to that person based on that information. And they are uh, providing indications and warnings that will shape the way the battle goes. Um, and so, yeah, I, I struggle with this every time because, yes, while that information does... Uh, help reduce casualties. It is still help facilitating war, and I mean that that's that's a talk that we get into all the time. And I, it's sad catch twenty two. Like, how close do you get to help designing this type of system? Um, yeah, I'll say it again. Like my my personal stance is I always work on defense, not not attack. Uh, so that's that's just me. Um, but yeah, that's I don't I don't know. It's a it's an interesting interesting thing. I think my <laughs> biggest hope here, and I don't really know how this plays out, like in a global scale. Of course, it it depends on like who's allied with who and all that kind of hard stuff to really think about. But hopefully, a lot of other militaries take cue from whatever Australia is able to determine from how do you even implement something like this from an in- artificial intelligence perspective into anything military related. And again, it could trickle down very well into how AI is handled in other domains, like in terms of autonomous vehicles and their decision making. So I think it's it's a large project with a pretty narrow, what seems like a pretty focused scope, but it could trickle down into a lot of different areas that AI is being used in. Yeah. Are at least closing thoughts anything? Okay. It's a pretty (laughs) loaded topic. Yeah, it's a beast. All right. It came from. It came from. It's actually not. It came from Reddit today. I didn't have a sounder for this prepared. I don't know. We'll figure something out. But I want to. I want to source from the community kind of what this what this thing should be called. Uh, but we've been wanting to do something like this for a long time. Um, I actually have here. So this is actually a uh, uh, a new segment on the show. I think that we're going to call something like Human Factors History or something like that. Uh, but I, I want to hear from you guys. What do you think it should be called? Uh, I have here in my hands um, the. 1999, March 1999 issue of the Journal of the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society. Uh, so we are taking a look back 20 years into the past to see kind of what we as a community were looking at back then, <coughs> to see kind of how we've grown, uh, or may still be researching some of these topics that are on here. So I'm just going to go through some of these topics, and I figure we could jump into a couple. Um, Under aerospace systems, who is flying this plane anyway? What mishaps tell us about crew member role assignment and air crew situation awareness? Aging uh, has eye movements of younger and older drivers. Still relevant. Uh, Age-related performance in a multiple task environment. Additional processes. uh, Processes. uh, Attentional processes. Wow, I can't even read. Blake, you should do this. Apparently. Double double trade-off curves with different cognitive processing combinations testing the cancellation axiom of mental workload measurement theory. People still using big words. Uh, Biomechanics. Uh, The effect of personality type on muscle 
Co-activation during elbow flexion. I really wanted to know what the end of that one was. I should have picked that one. Elbow flexion? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, under cognitive processes, we have uh, planning, shared mental models, and coordinated performance. An empirical link is established. Uh, interactive critiquing as a form of decision support. I like that one. That one's fun. Uh, an empirical evaluation. Displays and controls. Human sensitivity to variability information and detection decisions. Uh, designing an interface to optimize reading with small display windows. That's the one I picked. Uh, psychological states. Impairment of driving performance caused by sleep deprivation or alcohol. A comparative study. Uh, the discrimination, acquisition, and retention of aiming movements made with re with with and uh, without elastic resistance. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Sensory and perceptual processes uh, predicting optimal accommodative performance from measures of the dark focus of accommodation. What's the dark focus of accommodation? It's like the dark side, but it's for accommodation. Okay. Uh, auditory spatial facilitation. A visual search performance, effect of cue precision and distractor density, and under training, education, and instructional systems, we have a methodology for enhancing crew resource management training. So there it is, the March 1999, 20 years ago. I figure we could uh, jump into some of these here. Blake, do you want to, you, you picked under cognitive processes, processes, keep saying that, um, planning and shared mental models and uh, coordinated performance. An empirical link is established. It is, apparently. Yeah. What, what is it? So, okay, let's go over what a shared mental model is. So these are thought to provide team members with a common understanding of who's responsible for what task and, you know, what information requirements there are in order to complete a task. So allowing for team members to better, you know, anticipate each other's needs, whether it be communication or straight up actions. Like for another... Another way to put it is it's the idea that team performance improves if each team member has a shared understanding of what the task is to be completed and how to perform it. Uh, so overall, the article was looking at, so if you have more better shared mental models among different team members, is it able to help make, is it able to help making decisions easier? Does it make you more successful overall? Uh, between like whether you're planning, if you have a shared mental model, if you're coordinating to seem team decision making across tasks and ultimately the result that they found was that effective planning really increases the the team's ability to perform perform a lot better to communicate better to have more share or a higher shared mental model and this just ultimately results in co better coordination across a team and its own performance what did they find they basically found that providing information in advance of ex uh, execution so planning produced the best results and then teams that have high planning or high in planning, so they plan more, so it really make one of our coworkers laugh or tell us he told us so. So uh, use more effective <laughs> communication <laughs> strategies during higher periods of <laughs> workload. And probably what's strange enough, because they talk about shared mental models so much, is it had really no effect on either improvements in communication or performance itself. It was mainly only planning and good planning. Yeah. What's your plan in there? Yeah. What you planning over there? <laughs> uh, this is awful. But, yeah, so it was an interesting article, but we still study this stuff today. Like, shared mental models has been something that even I had to go through and learn in graduate school, and it's still, like, in a, especially in the DOD context, but I think in any kind of ta shared team essay studies now, I mean, they're really looking at, okay, do, what what is it that's attributing to the best shared mental models and is it planning communication? It's the same kind of stuff, just through different mediums, like using phones and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, one. Um, so the the one I kind of picked to d jump into here is only because I wanted to get kind of insight into the time that this was created. Was um, let's see, I did the uh, designing an interface to optimize reading with small display windows. So think about it, like 1999, cell phones were starting to become a thing. Uh, Flip phones more, were starting to become yeah a thing. more readily, right? And so. Um, I was kind of like interested in what research they were doing back then to, to uh, kind of pull this forward. And um, when I say RSVP, what does that mean to you? It means, it's not a trick question. It means I'm going to be late because <laughs> I didn't do it. Because you didn't, you didn't RSVP to the event. Um, did you, Elise? Did you RSVP? No, I didn't even get the invite. I didn't either. Okay. Thanks for stalling, guys. I'm looking for the page. Thanks, uh, where is the page? The page. Do you even know what 
RSVP stands for? I was just trying to think about that. Uh, I don't know. Hang on. Let's ask everybody's Alexa. What does RSVP stand for? And now we'll wait while everybody's Alexa is activated. <laughs> yep. And did you find the page? I'm looking for it still. I can't oh, goodness. focus. Okay. I can't talk. And oh wait, there it is. All right, found it. Oh, that's good Page. because if you're I following, don't know if I could define RSVP because it's actually in French. Mm-hmm. Oh, respond, respond please. Si vous plaît. I don't know. Anyway, um, so in this article though, they do call out RSVP, which is rapid serial visual presentation, which was a uh, a way in which they were thinking about presenting information on these mobile displays, which is basically presenting them with. Uh, words one at a time or um, uh, in this case it was sentences at a time or, or, or fragments of text at a time, right? So you'd read it and it would flash, like think carousel almost on a web page, but with chunks of information. For words? Yeah. Oh my goodness. 1999 but, was a strange place. But I will say they were not far off because like if you think about some of these reading apps, they you know keep the, the text in the same spot. So you're looking in the same spot and it just flashes one word by, by you at a time you can increase your reading words per minute. So, fun fact, this is highly related to my thesis topic from grad school, actually. Because it's not just for regular populations, but think of people who have low vision. They they still have a little bit of vision, so one of the most common accommodation methods that they use is to increase the size. So my thesis is all about, like, reading performance under those different conditions. So that was 2015, folks. That's still relevant. Yeah, still relevant. Um, so they do point out here at the end, though, that uh, they're, they're thinking that RSVP. Uh, I hate saying that. It's it's such a it's such a human factors person made up term. Yeah, they just like it, made something up feels, after something that already existed. Good idea, guys. It feels like it, right? Like, yeah, well, let's make something fit this. But uh, I I gotta say, like they they do say that um, this they could be onto something basically, and. Uh, Maybe marquee or or leading, um, kind of like tickers at the bottom of the screen, like they use New York Times, um, Times Square, as as an example, uh, where basically it's like marquee, where it's just scrolling, right? Yeah. They say that might be another method. Might be um, the future. Yeah, scrolls from left to right in a limited area screen in a fashion similar to advertisements on electric billboards. Uh, uh, let's see here. So did they test these things against each other, or they, they and they recommend one, or what was the outcome? They did. They tested them. Uh, I, w- I wish I could pull up the results here. So here's the results. There's graphs. Maybe you can zoom in, Jeff. I don't know. There are it's all bars on paper, and everything. folks. This is 1999. <laughs> this is 1999. There's no electronic version. I'm sure there is out there if we look. Uh, there's. So, yeah. Uh, basically, what they were testing, uh, <laughs> the 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 kind of key takeaways here is that the. Um, <laughs> RSVP did people hated it. <laughs> people hated RSVP. However, it did kind of have a little bit better of a uh, performance. So I don't know. I, I do have to say though, some of the speculations here are really funny to to like go back to and visit now, knowing what we know. Uh, they say the savings in screen space could be used to offer other resources and more functionality for the user. Similarly. If small display windows are used, computers, which have been unpopular for the purpose of reading entire books, may allow the reader to work within the text, uh, work with the text in ways that have been enjoyed only through printed media. It is feasible to design an interface in which text is interactively displayed one sentence at a time, while a separate region on the screen is devoted to note taking. By designing interfaces to work with text rather than only display it, the paperless office may take another step towards an efficient reality. That paperless office sure has happened. Oh, yeah, it's here. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny to think about what they were thinking about the future was back then. Um, and I think, I don't know, at least in our field, we've kind of gone away from the paperless uh, perspective because it just doesn't fit the type of work that we do. We draw on stuff all the time. Um, I don't know. It's, it's funny to think about where we were. At least, did you have one? Did you pick one out? No, I'm leaving you guys for that. Okay. All right. Uh, well, any other closing thoughts on this, guys? I can't believe that they were offering up the ticker tape as the way that we were going to read our text messages. Oh, my gosh. That's All right. Nuts. All right. Let's get out of here. That's it for today, everyone. Let us gu- let us know what you guys think of the stories this week and our new segment. Uh, I, I, th- I thought we had a little bit of fun with that. Uh, we'll probably do that once a month. 
If you're a Patreon supporter, we are going to get back to our coverage of all the space race stuff. Uh, Blake and I are scheduling some time. Well, Elisa's out at the healthcare symposium. We're going to knock some out, I think. The um, right stuff. Do you have it? Right we'll stuff. find out. We'll find out. Uh, if you like what you hear and want to support us on the show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. Uh, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us on any of our social channels at H Factors Podcast. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, Human Factors Cast. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnstorff for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about uh, scrolling interfaces? Oh, if you guys want to talk about scrolling interfaces, you can find me in the Human Factors Cast Slack or on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Elise Hallett, thank you for stopping by and giving us the uh, rundown on the Healthcare Symposium. Other than the Healthcare Symposium next week, where can our listeners go and find you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, probably the best option. Perfect. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends. It depends. It depends. <laughs>